to hear my conversation with Chad Wood, ETF strategist at McKenzie Investments. We'll explore what is an ETF anyway? This podcast is for informational purposes only. Information relating to investment approaches or individual investments should not be construed as advice or endorsement. Listeners should seek professional advice for their situation. Welcome to The Invested, a podcast for McKenzie Investments. I'm your host, Prana Matthews, VP of ETF Product Strategy. Today, we're diving into the world of ETFs and addressing some of the misconceptions that continue to circulate among investors and advisors. We'll explore how ETFs are built, what can be included in them, and how they are brought to market. We'll also debunk common myths such as the idea that active ETFs are just light versions of mutual funds or that they're always the cheaper option. Joining me today is Chad Wood, who has years of experience building and marketing ETFs and now here at McKenzie. Chad works closely with wholesalers and advisors across Canada. Chad is here to give us an insider's view into the life cycle of an ETF and what advisors and investors should keep in mind when comparing ETFs to mutual funds. So let's get started. Chad, thank you for joining the podcast today. Hey, Parna, thank you for having me on. Excited. Wonderful. Speaking of excitement, what excites you the most about ETFs? What excites me about ETFs? Two things, I would say, growth and choice. And I'll get into those uh, separately here. But what I do want to call out my former firm, like when I first got into the ETF business, I was actually offered a job two weeks before I accepted my ETF job and I turned it down. But then two weeks later, that same hire manager came to me and said, hey, I want to offer you that job, but it's focused on ETF marketing. Um, And I said yes right away. And it's because I wanted to really skate to where the puck is going. And I saw the growth in ETF and I was really, truly a believer. Um, And then now today, many years later, when we actually look at the numbers in the last three years, ETFs are growing at 12.5% per year. Mutual funds are growing around 2.5% to contrast that. Um, So maybe I was just lucky in, in choosing that and believing that they're going to grow, but they, they, they did it. And in the last 10 years, ETFs have doubled in size and we expect to see that again. And so that's really exciting to be in this industry. Then the lastly, a choice. There's so many choices in ETFs. There's over 1400 ETFs now. There's really an ETF for anything. If you're new to investing, there's asset allocation ETFs that you know, or by risk level um, that do everything for you and are very affordable. Like ours, uh, like MGrow is 17 basis points and you get a full mix of of VTFs, fixed income, uh, equity, whatever it may be, fully diversified. Um, There's ETFs that invest in very low cost beta. There's ETFs that are very active, um, maybe investing in real estate or infrastructure, uh, low volatility. So there's really an ETF for anything, just like the old saying when iPhones came out, you know, there's an app for that. That's what gets me excited. Those are important developments, certainly in in investment options for Canadian investors. So let's go back to um, something you mentioned, active ETFs. Uh, We've seen active ETFs grow significantly in the Canadian market. I think in the past seven or eight years, we've seen assets go from 16% of the total ETF market to 30%. So let's talk a little bit more about that because there's often a misconception. We hear this often that active ETFs are just stripped down versions of mutual funds or light versions of mutual funds. What's the reality here and how do active ETFs actually differ or are they similar from or uh, align to mutual funds as well in Canada? Yeah, and that, that's a good point. Like like you said, 30% of ETFs now in Canada are non-indexed, so most of them being active and that's quite large compared to, to other markets in, in the world. Um, and just to, I guess, level set for our listeners, like what is my job? So my job is, as an ETF strategist, I travel the whole country and it's really to talk to advisors, present to advisors uh, on ETFs, educate them, um, present at conferences. And usually it's always about educating on ETF trading or ETF strategies. But at the end of the day, trying to grow the advisor's book um, using ETFs because like I said, the growth is there. So the advisors are obviously seeing that as well. Um, and what you're saying about this, you know, ETF being a light version of a mutual fund, I hear a lot on the road, especially recently. Um, and it's because we've we started launching active equity on our ETF shelf that we also have a mutual fund version of. Um, so global dividend uh, fund, for example, we just launched an ETF version a few months ago and, and I was meeting with a client who said, I love the fund. 
Um, and I'm like, oh, and she's like, but I prefer an ETF. I'm like, well, lucky day. Like we actually have one now. Did you know that? She's like, no, but I'm not going to buy it because it's, it's just a watered down version. Like it's probably passive. Um, and I asked her why she thinks that. And she's like, well, that's just what ETFs are. They're just passive. So it really opened my eyes to everyone has a different perspective of ETFs. Um, and I'm here to say like to set the record straight, um, McKenzie's ETFs that are active are truly active. And we have a you know full fixed income shelf of active ETFs. We're actually a pioneer back in 2016 of a fully active ETF shelf that have an equivalent mutual fund. Um, but I think this misconception exists rightfully because not all firms did that. And I can speak from experience at my prior firm, they had a lot of active mutual funds that they were scared of, of losing assets to. So they just launched similar ETFs that were cheaper and not as active. And, and maybe like this advisor said, a watered down version. So you can't blame them because it's, it's not consistent across the market. Um, but it is important to know that just because it's an ETF doesn't mean it's a light version, like you said. But that is a misconception that uh, I do often have to to come against. And um, but I think it's important for advisors to ask that question. Great points, and I think another uh, data point that advisors can turn to uh, is fees, right? Because that's another way to see if an ETF and a fund are similar, or you know, if the ETF is a lighter version. So typically, you see. Um, pretty significant fee differences, right, between an ETF and potentially a fund that's managed by the same investment team uh, uh, or investment boutique, um, because no firm is really going to offer the same strategy in two different vehicles at, at significantly different price points that are accessible to the same investors. That's a regulatory concern, certainly in, in Canada. So, um, so fees definitely is another avenue to assess that. So let's turn our attention to the process of building an ETF. Uh, so you've You've done the building, you've done the marketing uh, of, of ETFs um, in your prior role, and now you're supporting um, those ETFs and, and um, our clients, our advisors in field. So can you walk us through the process of building an ETF from the ground up? What are some of the key considerations during this process uh, that uh, a product team needs to think about? Yeah, and there's a, and there's this question could be a whole podcast probably. Um, so I'm going to try and keep it um, relatively uh, high level, but the most important thing that at least when we're thinking, or at least when I think about product development uh, in the investment space is there's really two questions you need to ask. And, and one is, does this solution that you're building, um, does it solve a problem for the investor or does it help the investor or advisor with their portfolio construction or their investment goals? So that's number one. Number two, does it make sense for it to be an ETF vehicle? Um, because it's not the same as, say, a mutual fund or, or another product. So there's some clear differences between the two. Um, so first, that question, uh, does it uh, solve the problem? Um, and I'm going to use an example of McKenzie. We launched Q-Tip many years ago, uh, which is a you know TIPS ETF, so Treasury Inflation Protected Securities uh, product. So at the time, there wasn't a Canadian listed ETF uh, in the in the marketplace for a client or an advisor to allocate to tips and tips are very popular and they're for good reason they're inflation protected so if you had these you know pre-pandemic you were pretty happy um that you had it when inflation was starting to skyrocket it um it's guaranteed by the u.s government so from a fixed income standpoint these are really nice having a portfolio too um because uh, you know capital preservation so there's the you know the solution was there but it was either a US listed ETF that you had to buy or you had to go and actually buy bonds. So depending on the investor, like going to buy bonds might be something you've never done before. Um, and then buying a US listed ETF, this is where foreign tax withholding might come in depending on the type of account you're in and what you're buying. So not an ideal scenario for, for a client. So again, asking that question, does this solve a problem? And Q-tip solved the problem. We gave access, so easy ability to scale uh, for say an advisor looking to allocate to to their client's books, uh, easier to get access to for your regular uh, everyday investor since it's a Canadian listed ETF using your Canadian dollars, uh, but then also maybe more tax uh, advantageous from a Canadian tax perspective. So, boom, yes. So that's when we're building an ETF from the ground up. This was an amazing product uh, idea that actually solved problems. But then the second thing is, does it make sense for it to be an ETF or should this be a fund? Um, and this is really where you need to talk about liquidity 
uh, primary market, secondary market. So just the level set, there's, you know, two sources of liquidity on ETF. There's, as you know, the secondary market, which is, you know, how stocks trade and how much volume does ETF have. Uh, but more importantly, the primary market. So when we actually go out and buy these bonds for you, how liquid is that market? And in this case, with Q-tip, very liquid market, uh, we're able to get access, we're able to price. Um, and as everyone knows, ETFs trade throughout the day. So you need to be able to price um, this accordingly and keep spreads tight. And these checked all that boxes. So to answer the question, like, how do you build an ETF from the ground up? I think Q-tip is a great example of how it solves a problem for investor. And then the things you need to think about in terms of liquidity and if it makes sense to be an ETF vehicle. And obviously, is there demand for this? There was. Great. So you've given us an example of um, what can be put into an ETF. Can you give us some more examples of what other exposures uh, could be put into an ETF that might be surprising to some of our listeners? Um, and are there any limits or boundaries? Can you truly put anything in an ETF? Uh, and what does primary market liquidity mean in that context? Can you give us some examples? Yeah. And technically, in theory, you can put anything in an ETF, in theory. Will people buy it? Will it be efficient? Is it going to cost investors a lot of money? So that's what you need to think about. So in theory, yes, you can technically put anything into an ETF. You can put Pokemon cards in an ETF, but you're probably not going to be very happy. Not a lot of with, liquidity on those. Yeah. Well, you know, we Wayne Gretzky are Canadian companies, so maybe Wayne Gretzky rookie cards, right? Like how many of those are around? So putting that into an ETF, sourcing and pricing, it's going to take some time. Probably not the best to put an ETF. Um, but what I would say surprises most people, and this goes back to our previous question, is, is having truly active products in an ETF, I think, still surprises people. Um, and it makes sense because ETFs, when they did come around, say, you know, decades ago, they were primarily passive vehicles and they were very cheap. So anytime someone sees an ETF, they just, they still think that that's the only thing that goes in them is something that's passive. So I'd say still surprisingly surprising is the ability to put active. And it doesn't mean just, you know, your active portfolio or even manager, you know, picking and, and choosing which stocks to sell and buy, but you can also do things like add derivatives to to your products within an ETF as well. Um, like we have MUB, which is our unconstrained bond fund that is also exposed to some risky investments in the high yield bond space, but they have the ability to write puts in this ETF to help manage the risk of the risky investments. Um, so I think that surprises people that you're able to do and pull those types of levers um, in an ETF uh, vehicle. Um, but again, kind of answering that question like, what are the boundaries? And kind of going to what I was saying before, it's like, yeah, you can, like Bitcoin is a surprising one um, because the underlying market isn't really necessarily trade on the public exchanges. It's, it's it's kind of nuanced and people are confused with what cold storage is, warm storage, what all that stuff means. But there is a secondary market for it and it's been able to trade, um, at least for now, even though the primary market might be a little undefined. Um, but let's say, you wanted to open up a Venezuelan bond ETF. Well, then that's when these boundaries are going to really start to come in. Like how liquid is that bond market um, and how much demand is there on the secondary market? At the end of the day, the primary market, like we said before, actually going out and buying these bonds, how quickly can you do that? How quickly can you price these things? How accurately can you price them? And then what's good, what's the side effect of low liquidity in the primary market? Spreads are going to be, get bigger and bigger. And if you're a buyer, you have to cross that spread to own an ETF. Uh, so it's going to become much more unattractive to buy. And then if you're not buying it, why do we have it? Let's dive deeper into that comment you just made on spreads, just for our listeners to better understand that connection between ultimately what's in an ETF and then where that spread comes from. Because that is also still um, a bit of a misconception for a lot of folks who think maybe that spread is just what the market maker is making. It's the profit they're making off of me. I mean, we can even use that Venezuelan bond ETF hypothetical scenario and maybe something more liquid just to kind of compare and contrast. But tell us more about the direct connection of what you said goes into the ETF and how it translates to that spread. Yeah. And this is a good point. So at the end of the day, a spread is the difference between the ask price and the bid price, right? So how much is somebody willing to buy this thing and how much is somebody looking to sell this thing for us? So that'll be the spread. But at the end of the day, it's not as simple as that. That's how the secondary market works. Um, the middleman, so we'll call it the market maker, 
um, they're the ones that are actually holding these shares and taking the rest. So as you said, a lot of people might say the spread is just what the middleman's profit is, uh, but it can be far from that. So that in the Venezuelan or any international non-Canadian bond or investment market, there's foreign exchange costs um, for them to go out and cross and pay. There's um, opportunity costs holding this these uh, investments. So there's many things for them in the risk and they're hedging themselves with hedging costs. So they're on both sides of the trade. So they got to make sure they're not losing money at the end of the day. What's, what's the first rule of a business? Don't lose money. So this is built into that spread. And then how do you get a tighter spread? Well, that is where the secondary market comes in and can artificially make maybe a spread look tight. So that's where maybe you see a one cent spread or two cent spread. It's because there are, you know, me and you on the market. If you're looking to sell and I'm looking to buy, we put limit orders in, those go in on the market, but maybe we only have 100 shares each. But what if somebody's looking for 10,000 shares? Well, that's when the primary market is super important because if it's not liquid, how are you getting those 10,000 shares from just for secondary market? Great point. So uh, it's, it's important to remember both that primary market liquidity and secondary market liquidity. So then perhaps just a, a couple of minutes on um, comparing and contrasting mutual funds and ETF launches. So uh, you've just shown us why you know putting anything and everything into an ETF um, is not always the right thing for investors. Like it can be done, but it doesn't make it the right thing to do. Um, why is it okay then in a mutual fund? Is it like can you tell us more about obviously the differences in buying of how you know investors buy ETFs versus funds? Well yeah, and then like kind of said before, an ETF is trading intraday, right? You can buy and sell through the market. So a mutual fund is just one you, you put your order in and then they trade at the end of the day, at the end of day nav, uh, which is, would be the collection of the underlying portfolio. So definitely a much different scenario because the liquidity doesn't need to be instant um, throughout the day and pricing when you're actually watching an ETF, pricing is changing every every second the bid and ask are moving. Whereas in a mutual fund, they can consolidate all their orders from the day, buys and sells, and then there's just one transaction they're going to have to make at the end of the day. So it's just much more, I guess, simplistic on the, I don't even want to say simplistic, but just a little bit more on the mutual fund side that you have to worry less about what's happening intraday in terms of liquidity. Um, and that's why we often get asked these questions and we're like, hey, can we have a you know, micro cap um, ETF. And we always get these questions of like, why can't we have it in a fund? Why can't we do an ETF? And it's just at the end of the day, we need to make these marketable for our clients. Um, when they don't see this in the mutual fund, and then they're all of a sudden they're going to see it in the ETF and they have to cross that spread. These are the things that we have to, to think about and, and tackle. It's an explicit cost versus an implicit cost, right? And exactly. in, within mutual funds, a lot of these trading costs are become implicit they impact performance it's not that it's for free that liquidity yeah. isn't for free it's still there it just shows up in performance but in etfs that tends to be explicitly uh, appearing in the spread itself right so definitely a, a key consideration and why you tend to find as you say lesser liquid or illiquid and as well private assets within mutual funds compared to ETFs. There's also, of course, the the ability to close a mutual fund, which you can't do with an ETF, right? So if uh, a market gets um, suddenly less liquid, which has happened, right? Uh, whether it's, um, you know, global crises, uh, COVID, um, Russia, Ukraine in, in the early weeks, um, you know, there were funds that could temporarily soft cap or even close to new money. And, uh, Kind of a challenge to do that with something listed. Yeah, exactly. And you know, we've seen something similar in the ETF world if if they do cap, um, but then that's when you see price to nav uh, fluctuations, right? Premiums or discounts. So if if like an ETF is is closed or capped, then you're going to see massive premiums to buy into that versus nav. Um, so that can be obviously a problem. Um, so yeah, definitely. These are the main considerations when we're thinking about what, as a product team, it's like, okay, we have amazing ideas. We want to launch these these very niche or, yes, I'd love, trust me, privates and alternatives are all the rage right now. I would love if we were able to have an ETF that was able to give you exposure to private investments. Um, and, you know, obviously liquid alts are, are out there, but again, those are not the same as what uh, maybe an OM product would be on the private side. Um, so definitely 
we're seeing a lot of innovation in the ETF world, uh, but there's just certain things, at least right now, that are uh, restricting in terms of marketing a, an ETF that's uh, that actually works for everyone. Okay, great. So, Chad, um, to sort of wrap up our conversation today, can you help our uh, listeners understand what key metrics or factors to look for if uh, there's a similar ETF and a mutual fund or they seem similar, they're managed perhaps by the same investment team? And how should they be looking at performance, volatility, or cost as part of that decision as well? Yeah. And I'd say the first thing, you brought this up earlier. So the first thing you should really look at is the fee. Uh, If you're looking at similar ETFs versus mutual fund, you're trying to determine a, are these the same thing or are these different? If they have the same name, that's that's one clue, but that doesn't always, you could say, you know, high yield fund, high yield ETF, but that doesn't mean they're managed the exact same. So looking at the fee is very important. If the fees is the exact same, which in our case, if we have a mutual fund and an ETF version of the same thing, it's going to be within five basis points max, if not the exact same. When you're looking at like an F-series versus an ETF, for example. So I would say metric number one is looking at management fee. And I will distinguish between management fee and MER. So management fee is the base price of the product. MER includes taxes, but then also maybe an admin fee. So this is where when you're comparing an exact same ETF versus an exact same fund, the MER might be significantly higher, like 0.15% or 0.25%, whatever the admin fee is, could be the difference. So then what I would say when you're looking at these two funds and you're trying to determine which one is better for you, I would ask myself kind of a few questions. One, is there the admin fee on the mutual fund? If yes, is that material for you? If it is, maybe that's the decision maker. Second thing you can ask if you're still kind of up in the air is how long are you planning on buying and holding this this investment? Are you planning on holding it for one year, two years, 10 years, for as long as you can you can think of? Or are you planning on getting in this and selling it maybe a week later or a month later and then re- re-entering it and, and maybe jumping in and out of the position? And the reason why you ask yourself that question is, like we kind of mentioned before, an ETF does have a spread. That is an explicit cost that you have to pay on the way in once and then once on the way out. Whereas a mutual fund that has an admin fee that might be a little more expensive, this is just an annual expense every year that's going to be compounding over time. So I guess what I would say is if you're going to be trading in and out of this thing a lot, a mutual fund might actually be better because that explicit cost is not getting charged every time, like an ETF spread. Whereas if you're holding this long term, that annualized difference in fee is going to affect your performance. Um, and that, that could be maybe an ETF. If they're, you know, we're talking about like for like here, um, ETF might be favorable in that scenario. And then lastly, what I would say, what is easier for you, the client or the advisor? Like, let's say you're an advisor who's trying to buy something for 100 clients. Which one's easier for you to allocate to your clients? What's a better use of your time? And a lot of times we hear ETFs are easier to do that. If you have 100 clients, you can bulk trade once and then allocate ETF shares or units to your clients. Whereas maybe the mutual fund, you have to go in and enter 100 orders uh, for each client. And if you're spending, say, hours entering all these orders in versus minutes, like time is money. That time could be used to actually have good conversations with your clients. Um, so yeah, I would say those are are the few things. And at the end of the day, higher fee means lower performance long term. Um, but then also higher explicit fees mean less performance. So it's going to determine on what you're looking to do. But I would say those three things: admin fee, how long are you holding it, and what's actually easier for you operationally. Fantastic. Chad, thank you for joining us today. This has been a very valuable, insightful conversation. You've busted certainly some myths and misconceptions. So appreciate your time and uh, and your thoughts today on the uh, podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to come on. Uh, I love talking ETFs uh, and it's something I get to do luckily across the whole country and get a lot of different perspectives. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. That brings us to the end of this episode of The Invested. We've gained some valuable insights into the world of ETFs and dispelled some common misconceptions. Chad has provided us with an in-depth look at the process behind building an ETF, from what goes into them to how they come to market. We've also explored how active ETFs are more than just mutual fund alternatives and why understanding the nuances of these products are essential for advisors and investors. 
Remember, while ETFs offer numerous benefits, they aren't a one-size-fits-all solution. Advisors, investors need to carefully evaluate costs, performance, and client needs or your own personal needs when choosing between ETFs and mutual funds for your portfolio. We hope this episode has provided you with valuable takeaways on portfolio construction. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, please reach out via our blog or through LinkedIn. Until next time, stay invested. The content of this podcast, including facts, views, opinions, and recommendations, is not to be used or construed as investment advice and is not an offer or an invitation to buy or sell any security. The content of this podcast should not be relied upon for any purposes, and McKenzie Financial Corporation is not responsible for any reliance upon it. This podcast includes forward-looking information that reflects our current expectations or forecasts of future events. Forward-looking information is subject to risks and certainties and assumptions that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed herein. Our views are subject to change based on market conditions. Commissions, trailing commissions, management fees, and expenses may all be associated with mutual fund investments and exchange-traded funds. Please read the fund facts and prospectus before investing. The indicated rates of returns are historical annual compounded total returns, including changes to unit values and reinvestment of all dividends or distributions and does not take into account sales, redemptions, distribution, or optional charges or income tax payable by any security holder that would have reduced returns.